Okay, we'll get started. Welcome to DataPub. This is an online meetup for people who love public data sets and love to use them either in combination with one another or in combination with their own proprietary data. Our goal here is to bring different experts together and talk about best practices. Please use the Q&A button anytime during the talk and we'll read off your questions during the Q&A sessions following each speaker's presentation. We do have a code of conduct. So I'll link it to the chat bar so we can see it, but we are very much into practicing kindness here. So I'm now gonna turn this over to our very own data enthusiast, Prashat, for uh, opening remarks. Thank you, Nico. Oh, uh, hi, welcome. My name is Prashat, the marketing and developer relations team at Timescale. Uh, Timescale DB is an open source time series database. It's built on Postgres. Uh, time series data is uh, a series of data points that's indexed in time order. And we believe that all data is time series data, and there's many interesting, important things you can do uh, with your time series data. So I encourage you to visit our website, learn more at timescale.com. Uh, with this meetup series, Data Pub, uh, we wanted to explore what people are doing with public data sets. I happen to love public data, mining public data sets and unearthing insights into our world may feel like I did when I was a kid putting Legos together. It's exciting to see this community grow. It's exciting to watch this community uh, on Reddit, and it's exciting to hear from great speakers who share my love for public ed. So without further comment, let me introduce the speakers. Uh, we have Chris Wong, who's um, going to talk to us about taming uh, uh, the MTA, which is a subway system in New York. So I'm really turnstile data, something I'm really excited to see. Um, cleaning up data sets is a uh, pretty fascinating, um, uh, pretty fascinating uh, thing to me as well. Uh, I also uh, am excited to have Jonathan Leak join us today, and he's going to talk to us about building uh, regional analytics databases based on information that he's seen uh, in his local area of St. Louis. So without further ado, let me turn it over to Chris. Hi, um, everyone hear me okay? Sure. Uh, okay, so my name is Chris. Um, so the, the talk is called uh, Taming the MTA's Unruly Turnstile Data, and uh, it's more or less a narrative of this blog post, which is on the query blog, and I'll tell you more about query in a moment. Um, but you should, by all means, check out the blog because it'll have a lot of the footnotes that I am going to gloss over in this presentation, probably. Um, let's see what we can do. Uh, let me know. Can anyone? Can everyone see my uh, my presentation? Okay. Uh, so I, I have this tagline of urbanist, mapmaker, data junkie. Um, I studied urban planning. Uh, kind of fell into the open data world when it was really kicking off back in like 2012 and 2013 in New York. Uh, that's when we passed our open data law. Um, so since then, I've worked in various capacities, uh, sometimes in government uh, or adjacent to government, um, doing a lot of things with public data. Uh, so right now I'm an outreach engineer at a company called Query. Uh, we build data set version control uh, software. Um, you can follow me on Twitter um, and there's lots of other urban themed data themed projects that I've worked on over the years that you can find pretty easily. Um, so today I want to talk about uh, turnstile data. Um, so New York City MTA, which is a, or sorry, the New York MTA, which is a state agency, uh, but runs the New York City subway. Um, publish is, publishes uh, weekly turnstile data, um, kind of a no-frills website uh, that just has this long, long list going back to 2010. Uh, each one of these, if you download, is a 27 megabyte CSV with about 207,000 rows in it. Um, it seems like a really fun thing to dig into, um, but what you'll notice when you, when you download one of these data sets um, is that it just kind of comes out as this uh, kind of hard to parse um, you know, gobbledygook, uh, and it doesn't really, you know, you're not really sure what to make of it because um, there's a lot of uh, acronyms and codes in it. Um, and, you know, this, this, if you look at the header row up here, you know, entries and exits look, looks like uh, something we'd be interested in. But, you know, if you just look at the raw numbers here, we're looking at, you know, 7 million uh, entries, and maybe that's not what, what it's cracked up to be. Um, so it's a little hard to, to start using this data set, and I'll explain why uh, through these slides. Um, 
So each, each row is an observation which occurs every four hours. Um, the four hour observation windows are not the same for all turnstiles. Um, so you'll see some that run from midnight to four and then ones that run from 1 a.m. to 5 a.m. Um, and so on. So you don't really, you can't really do like a, a four hour block, um, you know, overview across the entire system. Um, some of the turnstiles are counting down and not up. Uh, and I'll explain what that looks like in a moment, which is kind of weird. Um, and um, the, the last three bullets here are more about the identifiers for the actual turnstile. Um, so I'll, I'll talk more about them in a second. Um, so they, you know, like good open data publishers should, they have a nice little metadata file that you can download that explains what these things are. Um, but basically, uh, booth, station, and turnstile are the things that identify one of these. Um, so the turnstile is, is one single turnstile that, that, you know, that turns and has a counter in it. Um, the booth is more or less uh, a subway entrance. Uh, sometimes that's not entirely true, but basically that's like a bank of turnstiles because you'll, you'll kind of see them, you know, four in a row or three in a row or whatever. Uh, and then the station is, you know, what you would expect the station to be, although that sometimes changes too. Um, so going back to what the, the original CSV looks like, uh, we have a booth, a station, and a turnstile. Um, so this is basically looking at a single, you know, each row is a single observation from a single turnstile. Uh, so to, or, in order to do anything useful with this, you know, nobody, care, nobody really cares about one turnstile. Um, you need to aggregate them up. Uh, and that's basically what this talk is going to be about because we um, were able to aggregate them up to daily and then, uh, <clears throat> and then uh, daily station level turnstile data. Um, so I'm going to tell you about the data pipeline that we built to do that. Um, so just to drive, uh, so th this, this photo just kind of connects the, the codes in the data set to the real world. And if you look in the background of this photo of a ribbon cutting at Knickerbocker Avenue Station, uh, you'll see booth K19. And then in our data set, um, where there's a, not in our data set, but in, in the lookup table that they also provide, uh, you'll see that there's a booth called K019 at Knickerbocker Avenue. Um, so this is how we actually can tie, you know, the, the codes in this data set to physical things in the real world. Um, but this is what booth means. It's a, it's a literal booth uh, that's keeping watch over these turnstiles uh, in the subway station. Um, so then uh, we, you know, we can look and see that there are four different turnstiles in this, in, in this booth uh, or associated with this booth. Um, and in this particular station, there's actually only four turnstiles to get in uh, altogether. Um, I have a SQL query here that looks for the distinct, um, distinct SCP, which is the, the identifier for the turnstiles right here. Um, you can see that there's actually five of them in here, but one of them uh, has last reported on 2019, uh, January 29th. So um, there are actually only four. I'm not sure why this one showed up as number five. Um, and maybe, maybe they took it out or something. Um, but uh, it is, you know, this is how we are kind of aggregating each of these things up into something useful. Um, so the trick with these is that the, is that the uh, entries and exits are not counts. They're like an odometer. So they're not really useful to you unless you actually know uh, the previous one, uh, and then you know the timestamp for it as well. Um, so now I can say, by looking at these two rows in this data set, I can say between uh, 7 and 11 at whatever, whatever station and turnstile this is, um, by subtracting the entries uh, and the exits numbers, I can see that there were 66 entries and 71 exits um, between, you know, at this point in the morning. Um, so again, that's just one turnstile, so I need to, you know, count all of them. I, have to, I need to do the same calculation for all of the turnstiles in a single station, and then I might have a number that makes something uh, something like more sense to me. Um, I first messed with this back in 2013. I made this kind of nifty uh, animation using processing uh, way before I was doing like web data viz. I was doing like video data viz and processing. Um, and uh, I won't play it here for you now. You can go watch it. It's kind of mesmerizing, but it uh, shows little, little green dots entering and little red dots exiting and shows it over time, which is kind of neat. Um, so I haven't touched it in a long time, and I've always been, it's always been on my list to do some sort of automated uh, cleanup of this data set. Um, so I'll just jump right into it. Um, the first thing we, uh, well, I want to give a shout out to Todd Schneider, um, who's uh, another uh, civic-minded data person in New York who puts a lot of their code online, and they, they actually did a whole lot of the legwork uh, that I used in this, in this uh, SQL database. Um, so first, we make a giant table with all the weekly data in it. Uh, it's got about 14 million records in it. Um, I, I started at the beginning of 2019 and just went um, until the present. Um, and then basically every week I dump uh, the new rows into this table. Um, but there's a few things I do to clean up. So this first one is this uh, unique ID, which is effectively a, a concatenation of the timestamp, um, the turnstile ID, the booth ID and the station ID, um, all those things put together are, be, become a unique ID for a row in this new data set. 
Um, so then we also have a unique ID for the turnstile, which is just the, the station booth and turnstile concatenated together. Uh, I leave the original values just so we can sanity check them. Uh, I turn the date and the time, which were two separate columns, into an actual a proper timestamp in PostgreSQL. Um, so now we can actually do you know, time calculations on it. And then um, calculate the entries and exits. And this part's fun because we get to use uh, lag and over, uh, which is not something you get to use a whole lot in Postgres, but it basically you know, is able to calculate uh, values based on the, the preceding row or the, or the following row. Uh, in this case, the preceding row. Um, so this is the SQL that does this cleanup. I won't spend too much time on it, but I want to throw in some caveats here uh, where you see this greater, uh, this less than 10,000. Uh, we're basically throwing out um, uh, bad values uh, and 10,000 effectively represents 41 entries per minute or exits per minute on a single turnstile. Um, so because of the nature of this data, uh, sometimes the turnstile counters roll over and they'll end up with like, you know, a million people, uh, you know, uh, registered for one four hour time period. Um, so 10,000 is, is an appropriate threshold, but it's definitely rife with problems um, because there may be things right up against the threshold that were still inaccurate. Um, so it's kind of a best effort to, to throw out the astronomically large numbers that are unrealistic, but uh, keep, the, keep things sane. Um, so the next step, once we have this giant table uh, with some cleaned up columns is to aggregate by date and sum the entries and exits. Um, so here what we're trying to do is, is uh, come up with the uh, entry and exit counts for a single um, turnstile for the day. Um, so now I can say uh, whatever turnstile, you, specific turnstile this is, instead of looking at the four hour chunks, I can now kind of put those all together and say, okay, this one turnstile, 835 in, 303 out. Um, and that takes us from 14 million down to 2 million records. Um, so the other trick here is which day should this observation period count towards, um, because if, if it starts at 10 and ends at 2, it's kind of in both days. Um, so you could have interpolated that and split it up. We didn't do that. Um, so we're basically uh, just adding two hours to offset it, uh, which I, now that I look at the SQL, I'm actually worried that I think I should be uh, subtracting instead of adding those two hours um, to offset the time. Um, so I will revisit that. Um, but my data set is in version control and I can annotate that and I'll let to show you that in a moment. Um, so once we have the turnstiles aggregated, I'm uh, sorry, the data for each turnstile aggregated, we aggregate up to station and complex. Uh, this is where it gets tricky because uh, not all stations are their own station. Um, so what is considered a station in the data set might really be a complex of stations. And here's two examples. One is Fulton Mall and down in lower Manhattan. Uh, and the other one is Lexington Avenue, 59th Street, um, basically where you can transfer between what used to be two different stations on the subway, uh, but are now treated as one. Um, so counting the entries and exits for them uh, separately doesn't make any sense because you, you can't really attribute the entries and exits uh, to a specific one of these two stations. Uh, they could have, the person could have gone to any platform. Um, so you really need to combine all those together in order to get something accurate uh, for what I'll call station or station complex. Um, so this is a, you know, we needed a lookup table where we could actually take the identifiers that are in the data set um, and associate them with a station complex. And we found that in this, uh, this master, this sort of official list of, of, uh, of uh, NYC subway stations um, where there's something called a complex ID. So you can see station ID and complex ID are one and the same for most stations, but uh, if the station is part of a complex, then complex ID has this three digit number in it. Um, so what we ended up having to do is this, uh, you know, three table uh, relationship where I can take a remote unit, uh, which is a station code from the, the raw data set, uh, check out this lookup table that I made that connects the two, and then get the rest of the goodies from the official station list, including the latitude and longitude, the official station name that's a much uh, prettier station name to use in, um, in visualizations because it's not all, all caps, and a few other goodies that are in this list. Um, so kind of putting together three different, um, three different data sets to make something more useful. And behold, um, so we wrap that all up and we can do station slash station complex level daily entrances and exits by just summing these entries and uh, just by grouping. Um, so here we can see, uh, you know, January 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, um, you can start to see a, a simple pattern for weekends. Uh, so these, this is a Saturday and this is a Sunday and then th these five would be a weekday uh, and you can see that pattern start to emerge. Um, and then tying it all together is basically a whole bunch of, uh, this is a shell script that just runs a bunch of SQL. So every Sunday, every Saturday afternoon, I, I, I hit go on this and it takes about 
uh, four minutes to run. Uh, and it spits out an, an updated CSV that has a, a few more rows, uh, basically including the last week. Um, so it, it's, it's, pretty, uh, it's pretty safe at this point and it works pretty well. Um, but you can see that I'm just kind of running down the list and executing uh, psql commands. And then at the very end, uh, spit out a CSV. Um, so what do I do with that CSV? Uh, this, this is the time for the shameless plug of query, uh, but we are versioning, uh, we're data, data uh, sorry, we're software for uh, versioning and publishing data sets. Um, so we're a version control system, a database, uh, and a peer-to-peer -peer network. Um, you can think of these as portable tables. Um, so you can kind of make your own database quickly from things. Uh, another way we describe it is NPM for data sets. Um, we, uh, we consider a data set to be much more than just the, the data itself. Um, so we have uh, metadata that rides with the data and gets versioned with it. We have a, a readme file that's marked down um, that's you know, very friendly for explaining things about the data set. Uh, we also have something called transform script where you can automate updates to the data set. Uh, in this case, I don't use it, but effectively the output of my SQL data pipeline becomes a new commit on a query data set, um, which oh, I think that slide didn't work. Um, but effectively, uh, gets pushed up to Query Cloud, which is the equivalent of our, our hosting platform, uh, where you can see the README. Um, and um, basically, the oh, that's what I wanted to show. Oh, I can't show it. Okay, looks like that one didn't work. But um, basically, the, there's a commit history um, because I've been updating this data set uh, on a weekly basis for the last few months, and uh, you can actually see, you know, every Saturday when the data set gets gets updated uh, and track changes to it in the way you would a, a code repository. Um, so uh, to wrap up, uh, you know, some interesting things people do with this data. Um, I, I, every Saturday, just tweet out this sort of high level chart. Um, it's kind of been fascinating. We, we started this right after coronavirus took hold and uh, you saw this precipitous drop um, and just kind of watching it every week ever since it's just been like slowly creeping back up and we're all kind of waiting to see, you know, as New York starts to reopen, uh, you know, what will the change look like in this data set? So if you follow me on Twitter, you can see that every Saturday and get a, a quick view of, of what that looks like. Um, I'll show some other people's work because again, I, uh, this is much more about the data pipeline, um, but uh, this, these are people's blog posts that have done things with the same data source. Um, so this is Ben Wellington is a notable uh, civic uh, blogger, uh, data blogger here in New York City. Um, but basically analyzed the 30% the drop and, and did this fascinating correlation uh, with median income uh, versus ridership drop in the, in the subway uh, and discovered, you know, of course, what we expect that the, the much lower drop in ridership where the, the median income is lower because uh, people are uh, much more dependent on public transit or still have to work, uh, can't work from home. Um, this is another one by someone named Charles Safe uh, who, who did a, a similar analysis and, and has a nice Twitter thread about it. Uh, and then when I told him, you know, I did all the work for you, you could have just downloaded and not had to, to, to clean up the raw data. And he was very happy about that. And that's kind of what we're going for at Query is we want to be able to have, you know, somebody clean up data once and publish it for the world to, to share and then everyone else can, uh, can benefit. Um, so that's my talk. Uh, definitely check out the blog post, um, check out the animations and uh, hope you might want to get your hands dirty with our um, turnstile data, which is cleaned up and ready to use. So thank you. Great, thank you. Um, and also we have a, we do have a question from um, Steve. Isn't hourly data more useful than daily for capacity uh, and journey planning? Yes, uh, I'm sure it is. So I think we were, you know, looking for uh, what could be the, the, the simplest thing to be able to, to, you know, make the, I guess the very high level chart that I showed, um, but be able to do the same thing at the station level. Um, is what we were going for, but for sure, we lose granularity. We lose uh, the ability to look at, you know, the, the four hour periods over time. Um, so we, you definitely can't do hourly, but um, four hours, four hour frequencies is the, is the minimum. Um, but it gives you a little more resolution within the day for sure. Perfect. Thanks. So anybody else have any questions? Ian says, great talk. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it was. Perfect. We'll, we'll, we'll be um, following up with recordings as well as um, ways to get in touch with uh, Chris. So if you want to uh, Twitter at him, which his handle's there, you're more than welcome to. Perfect. Okay, great. So our next uh, presenter um, is Jonathan Leake. Uh, 
How's it going, everybody? Let me share my screen really quick. All right, so I'm with the St. Louis Regional Data Alliance. We're a nonprofit organization focused on making data more accessible and usable, which are not the same thing. <laughs> um, in the St. Louis region. So uh, we cover a 16 county region. Oh, this is, oh, there we go. Um, so one of the realities about open data is that it's, it's highly fragmented and siloed, right? Um, using St. Louis as a case, kind of a case study, we have an IT department for the city, but that IT department is more about keeping things running and supporting, uh, a few key shared systems, but for the most part, each department's kind of left to their own devices in terms of developing their IT infrastructure. So the assessor's office has a database, the building division has multiple databases, and they just kind of get left to their own devices in terms of what platform they're using, identifiers, things like that. As a result of this, most of the data that's made available through our public portal is not intended for consumption by the public. It is made available to the public, but it is it was never designed with that purpose in mind. So uh, documentation tends to be pretty sparse. Things are designed more for the automated systems that they're attached to rather than for like human consumption. So data fields have esoteric names. Um, there's tends to be multiple competing IDs, depending on which department you talk to for the same theoretical concept for what would be a citizen. Um, and at the end of the day, most of the stuff is not developed by data professionals, right? The assessor's office database was developed by an assessor who learned a little bit about databases, like <laughs> Google database, found Microsoft Access, and did the best they could in order to do their key job, right? Um, and then all of the, all of the open data kind of, uh, and, and analytics is kind of a secondary afterthought. So looking at real estate data, we're, we're kind of tackling this in the St. Louis area by building what we're calling the regional entity database. This is like a whole separate talk about like what this is um, and why we're doing it and the details of it. But essentially we're building a database that pulls in from all these other desperate databases does all of the confusing work of like figuring out how the different IDs relate to each other, how one database informs another database, like all of that confusing work, we're gonna do it once in an automated fashion, create a database that is designed for the general public's use, that has simple tables with names like building or permit, um, and document that really well and make that uh, usable to the public and use it to power a series of tools for the public to make this data more more publicly accessible. So that's kind of what, what we're going to be talking about today, but we're going to be talking about how we're building this, not necessarily the, the details of the schema itself. Uh, so the process. Uh, in the city of St. Louis, most of our data sources are either access databases, Excel files, CSVs. There are a few I found a uh, .dbf the other day, um, like there's some weird ones, um, but for the most part, it's overwhelmingly access Excel and CSVs. Um, we're going to download these from the city's data portal. We're going to like decompress them because a lot of them are in archives. And we're gonna store them into an, uh, an AWS S3 bucket. Uh, for those of you that aren't like AWS, like cloud savvy bucket, you can basically think of it as a Dropbox. It's just an empty storage space that we can put things into. Uh, after it's been put there, we can then read those files into our database. So first they go into a staging schema that is an exact copy of what exists in the files. Um, we're not doing any data cleanup at, as part of this process. So any typos, um, formatting errors, all of that, we're leaving that intact. Uh, it's just, a, it would be a never ending battle for us to kind of keep up with that. Uh, so staging one, uh, the staging one schema is this run. So if I run this on a weekly basis, this would be this week and staging two would be that same data set, but as of last week. Um, and we're storing both of those so that we can do a comparison. And that allows us to find what I'm, what I will refer to as dead records. Um, right now we're dealing with all parcel data. So parcels of land, buildings on those parcels of land. Um, and sometimes those parcels of land get 
combined, right? And a parcel will just disappear. So we need to be able to capture those and just figure out what has changed, what has been updated. Uh, we use those lists to then populate uh, our core schema. That core schema contains all of history. So say I were to sell my house, rather than update the owner in the row that corresponds to my house, we will add a new record that has all of the same information about this house, but with the updated owner. And we'll have fields for tracking when things were updated and what the current state is. That way, if you want to go back and look at, you know, well, what, who was the owner of this house a year ago, you're going to be able to do that. Um, but that's going to require some fairly extensive SQL foo. So in order to make it easier for our users, um, we're also going to have a current schema that's only going to have the records that represent the current state. And we'll generate that off of this historical state. So the tools that we're using to do this primarily are Terraform, Airflow, and AWS. So uh, a brief overview of each of these. Terraform is an infrastructure as code tool. It allows me to um, program all of our AWS resources rather than mucking about in their console every time I want to do something. Uh, this is important for a lot of reasons. It documents what we have in AWS. It allows us to version control what we have in AWS. And it allows me to develop without accidentally leaving a database live somewhere that ends up costing us a few thousand dollars uh, because I left it running for a month and didn't intend to. Um, very common uh, cloud practice for those of you who haven't done cloud development before. Uh, AWS Cloud Platform allows us to do uh, virtual machines, servers, cloud storage, networking, databases, you know, all, all that good cloud stuff that you need so that we don't have to own our own servers. And then Apache Airflow is uh, open source scheduling software. So the developers out there, it's basically cron, um, but as a service. So it runs on its, uh, we actually have a cluster. Um, and uh, it's cron, but it also adds error handling and conditional runs and you can add hooks, um, just a much more complete product. So that's what we're gonna use to kind of manage all of the code that's gonna be running. So this is what that cluster looks like. If you go, I've got the link to the GitHub below, but uh, if you were to run this repository Airflow code, this is what you would get. Uh, the VPC is just the virtual private cloud, right? Um, we've got a, a metadata database. This is a Postgres database that stores when your code is supposed to run, how well it ran last time, what errors you got, like all of the metadata involved with the scheduling aspect basically gets stored in the metadata database. And then you have an arbitrary number of servers, uh, but they fall into three types. You will have a, uh, a web server, which gives you a fancy UI front end so that you can look at all of this stuff. It's one of the other advantages to Airflow over Cron is we have a GUI um, for exploring all this stuff. Uh, the scheduler that actually figures out, it looks at the metadata, da uh, the metadata database, figures out what needs to run and when, and distributes that workload out to an arbitrary number of workers. Um, right now we're just doing it with one worker, but you can set this to whatever arbitrary number you want based on your budget and how much work you have going. Um, and all of this stuff communicates with each other via Redis uh, and has an internet gateway so it can talk to the outside world. So that's the cluster. There are a few pieces that are important to this that don't really fit in this cluster mindset, but are important to know about. Um, in order to make our project management work, we have another GitHub repository called Airflow Admin Tools. So when this cluster spins up, it's important for the, uh, the workflows in Airflow are called DAGs. Um, so you have DAG files, and then you have the various scripts that those files reference. Um, those files all need to be on every server that you have in your cluster. So in order to facilitate that, we have an elastic file system, which in AWS is essentially a mountable dr cloud drive, uh, where we can store all of those files. And then that drive is mounted on every machine that you've got in the cluster. 
And the first repository that it will pull in by default as part of the initialization and configuration of all these machines is an admin tools repository. And that provides some basic tools for importing other projects, uh, adding users, and adding connections. Because Airflow will actually manage your connection secrets. So if I need to have developers write stuff that will connect to a database, I don't actually have to give them connection information to that database. Uh, they can just reference it. Uh, which is very important for an open source project like us. So the way the project workflow works, uh, if you wanted to recreate what we're doing, you would first run the repository we just looked at to set up your Airflow cluster. Uh, then for each project, you would use this template repository uh, to create the other pieces you need for an ETL project. So in the cluster, uh, you don't know which worker is going to be doing any particular piece of code. So they need kind of a shared workspace in order to save files. Because if worker one saves a file to its local directory, and then worker two tries to access that file and can't find it, your job's going to fail. So you need a shared space. And for us, we just use another S3 work bucket because they're, they're very cheap and easy to work with. And then you need a target, right? Like once all these files get create, like get dealt with, they need to go somewhere. So we're, we're setting up a database. So very simple Terraform. Uh, if you wanna look, look at Terraform and kind of learn how it works, good repository to look at, very basic. The second type of repository you're gonna need to spin up and clone is our workflows document. So admin tools is the first one that gets created and it kind of runs on as part of the configuration system outside our usual project management workflow. But each project, uh, they're all managed in Git, and you have a DAGs folder, a scripts folder, a resource folder. You can put other stuff in there, but this is what really what it looks for. DAGs contains the files that schedule and define kind of the, the flow chart that defines how you want your code to run. Scripts contains the actual code that you want to run. Resources contains anything else you need, right? If your job needs to reference a static CSV, um, we just put it there so that we have a place to put it. Uh, one of the jobs that are that is in this admin tools imports other projects. So we have a projects.csv in this resources folder. Um, you add your project repository to that list, you run the DAG, and then it will add it to that EFS drive that's mounted in the cloud and symlink it to the appropriate spot in Airflow's directory structures that Airflow can find it. Um, and you can do that with an arbitrary number of projects. Um, as long as you've got a, a beefy enough uh, cluster, you can have thousands of projects running through this system. Um, so that's how we have all of this working. And once you have that done, you can just start focusing on creating your DAGs and things like that. So. Uh, that's all I had. Uh, I guess I'm open for questions. Thank you, John. Anybody has any questions? Oh, here we go. How many CPU cores are in each cluster? And how did you decide how many CPU cores should be in each cluster? Yep. So uh, in our cluster definition, uh, there's a configuration file where you get to decide the size of each machine in your cluster. So you define, I want my web server, let's go back to, I want my web server to have be a T2 micro, I want my scheduler to be a T3 small, like however you want to do that. Um, we have these all set to basically the smallest that will run. Um, the data, the open data in St. Louis doesn't update all that quickly, especially the real estate data does not update all that quickly, right? So we're probably only gonna be running these jobs say once a week, and it's not super important that these jobs run quickly. Um, so if a job just takes, you know, if it takes two, three hours to update, it takes three hours to update. Um, right, uh, so right now I would say the workflow, the workers are roughly equivalent to like iPhone fours. Um, they're like T2 micros. Um, but you have the, the ability to configure that. Um, and ultimately, we want to get to the point where it's set up to be auto-scaling. 
uh, because of the parallel nature of this, it's generally better to just spin up more workers than to create larger workers. And RAM actually tends to be the deciding factor because any given task at any given time, the compute cost tends to be pretty low. It's just a question of can you fit all of the uh, data that you are working on into the worker? Because again, they're basically iPhone 4s. <laughs> um, so hopefully that answers the question. Um, you just have to look at your throughput how much you're gonna be using the database or using the system, how much data are you gonna be pumping through the system and kind of make your adjustments there. The nice thing about Terraform is it's very easy to adjust that on the fly. Uh, yeah. We have a couple more other questions. Okay. Uh, one is from Chris Wong or other speaker. Uh, what do you do once it comes out the other end? Is each new version hosted online somewhere and do you publish the log changes as their own files? Yeah, so the plan right now is that once we get it to this, uh, this will be a Postgres database. We're gonna provide an API access to that database um, and provide CSV dumps of each table so that if you're just an Excel warrior and you don't understand how to work with APIs, you can just go to a website and just download the, you know, the Excel file version of the parcel table and, and go from there. Um, Outside of that, we're looking at, we're still looking at some of the other options for how to share this data. We want it to be as accessible as possible, but we are a nonprofit and, you know, every different way we do that costs time and money of which we both, you know, we have very little of. So, um, so we're going to kind of play that by ear. Uh, we're also planning on building several tools off of this. So the two we have um, on a roadmap right now, one is a vacancy portal. So all of this whole project started because I built a, uh, very basic vacancy map at stlvacancy.com for the St. Louis area to explore the tens of thousands of vacant buildings we have in the St. Louis area and where they're distributed and who owns them and all of that good stuff. Um, but that was not an automated website. So if you go and you look at that map, that map hasn't been updated since June 2018. Uh, once this database is fully functional and feature complete, we will be able to redo that map off of this and it will always be up to date. Um, the second thing we wanna offer based off of this is, I'm calling it Carfax for Houses. We haven't really come up with a name for it yet, but I think it's really ridiculous that I can go to a website, put in my VIN and find every car wreck and like every wreck and work done I've had ever had to my used car. But if I wanna buy a house, it's really hard to find code violations and permits um, for that house. So using this database, we can build that portal and make that service available to everybody. Right. And our next question uh, from Ian is, uh, you're doing amazing work in the public with public data. Have you thought about expanding this work beyond St. Louis? Uh, well, thank you, first off. <laughs> um, so this schema database is being designed to be municipality agnostic. Uh, in St. Louis, we have a city county split. So St. Louis, there's a St. Louis city county and a St. Louis county. It's one of the reasons we keep showing up on the high murder rate lists is because uh, we've basically drawn a circle around the most violent parts of St. Louis and said that this is St. Louis um, and ignored all the suburbs, um, which is really throwing our numbers off. <laughs> um, but our intention is to have this schema and this methodology used by other cities. Uh, we're currently in talks with Memphis to uh, potentially bring this methodology and help them get this involved. But my hope is eventually this uh, entity database schema will become a national standard. So we are working with that. And one of the reasons I have all of these different GitHub repositories available is so that other people don't necessarily consult me if they want to try this on their own. Uh, all of our work, including our DAG workflows, is available online. So if you go visit our uh, GitHub account, um, GitHub profile, you can find the DAGs and you could spin up a completely independent copy of our database on your own. Awesome. Anybody else have any questions? If not, we're also gonna be, um, as I said, uh, doing a follow-up and we'll have the contacts for um, John and Chris. So if you have any more questions, you can reach out to them. Um, but yes. Thank you both to our speakers. Um, I think that was a lot of fun. I appreciate <laughs> your time. Um, but 
yeah, if you want to um, speak at, if anybody out there wants to speak at another meetup of ours, please let us know. Um, but um, thank you again to everybody. And, you know, please uh, let us know um, if you'd like to join our next meetup, which is on June 16th. We'll be following up information for that. But once again, thanks again to the speakers and thanks again for um, joining us for our meetup today. Thank you, everybody. Yes, recording is available um, and yeah, <laughs> thank you.